Enbridge has a payout ratio of 125% and could lose substantial revenue if they are forced to shut down one of their major pipelines, which accounts for 18% of their total crude oil transportation. As a recent investor in Enbridge, this is worrisome to say the least. In this video I will explore if the dividend is in danger and if I made a mistake buying Enbridge by taking a hard look at the issue in the business of Enbridge, their financials, valuation and of course if their dividend is in danger. Enbridge has been given until May 12 to shut down their Line 5 pipeline, which runs through Michigan and is vital for the energy supply of Quebec and Ontario. The shutdown is imposed by the governor of Michigan, Gretchen Whitmer, because the pipeline running through the Straits of Mackinac is supposedly a ticking time bomb which could explode at any minute. Enbridge has already stated that it will not comply because they believe the governor does not have the right jurisdiction and her claims ignore scientific evidence. If somehow Enbridge is forced to shut down their Line 5 production, this could pose a big problem not only for Enbridge, but for all the people that rely on the pipeline for crude and propane, which is also transported through the pipes. Before we take a look at the impact this could have on the revenue of Enbridge, a potential dividend cut and how likely it is that the pipeline will actually be shut down, let's take a step back and look at the business and financials of Enbridge. Enbridge operates as an energy infrastructure company, which means they take care of transporting and storing different energy sources such as natural gas, crude oil and renewable energy. Enbridge transports about 25% of all crude oil produced in North America. There's a lot to love about this company, its predictable income stream, their wide moat and generous dividend increases, which I will all cover. The business model of Enbridge is quite simple, at least on the surface. They provide the infrastructure to transport energy sources such as crude, propane and other sources. And in turn they are paid for the amounts that run through their infrastructure. They basically operate similar to regulated utility and pipeline business. And because of the regulated nature of their contracts, it is a low risk business model. Across all of its businesses, Enbridge has minimal direct exposure to commodity prices. Almost all of the firm's EBITDA is generated from regulated cost of service contracts. They also have toll escalators built into the contracts, which means the growth on their existing infrastructure is already secured. And as an investor, I love this kind of predictability. And the vision of Enbridge is quite clear. They want to be the leading energy delivery company in North America. To become that, Enbridge has diversified its assets aggressively in the most recent years to keep up with the evolving global energy mix. They merged with Spectra Energy in 2017 to speed up this process. They also keep a long term horizon and have multiple renewable energy projects, such as solar, off and onshore wind farms and waste heat recapture. Companies like Enbridge keep growing by constantly finding new avenues of growth and investing heavily into their existing and new infrastructure projects. But as an investor, there was something important I had to know before I decided to invest in Enbridge. It was not their dividends, although they are very nice. It is also not their sales or their profits, which I will look at later in the video, it is their sustainable competitive advantage or moat. Without that, a company's profits can be eroded just like that. Enbridge is North America's leading midstream energy company. It is very hard for new competition to enter since the industry is very capital intensive and highly regulated. Most new product proposals for pipelines also don't get approved unless there is a real need for them making it increasingly more difficult for companies with fewer infrastructure to enter the game. Joe Biden cancelled the Keystone XL project in an executive order on his first day in office, which is a major blow to one of Enbridge's closest competitors, TC Energy. And the non-reliance on commodity prices and the fact that they have long-term contracts with some of the biggest names in the industry give them a strong edge which is very hard to overcome. But what about the money? How much sales or revenue does Enbridge generate? As a pipeline company, Enbridge generates the revenue from crude, gas and other liquids that run through their infrastructure. They act as a toll bridge and often have long term contracts with big energy players like Exxon, Chevron and Consolidated Edison. And unlike those energy producers, their profitability is not directly tied to oil and gas prices, which makes their revenue a lot more predictable. Like I said, I like that predictability. Based on the EBITDA income, a bit more than half of the income comes from their liquid pipelines, a bit more than a quarter gas transmission and the rest from gas distribution and power and other. If Enbridge would lose the Line 5 pipeline, because of the forced shutdown this accounts for about 18% of the total crude oil Enbridge transports, according to this article on Seeking Alpha, which obviously would have a significant impact on the sales of Enbridge. In turn this could lead to a problem for different coverage, which I will get into in a bit. 
Looking at the trend of revenue, Enbridge had a steady uptrend with a decline in 2020 due to the reduced use of oil and other energy sources because of the pandemic. Enbridge has been steadily increasing its operating margins in the last few years, meaning there's more room for error and in turn less risk. But compared to some of their close competitors like TC Energy and Pembima Pipeline Corporation, their operating margins are still the lowest, so that is something to think about. Then the net income or profits of Enbridge. If I look at the net income trend of Enbridge in a glance, I could very quickly discard Enbridge as a potential investment, because I look for companies with growing profits or net income. But if I look a little further and dig into how a pipeline company like Enbridge operates, I discover that there's more than meets the eye. Because for pipeline companies like Enbridge, net income is not the best metric to look at to gouge the real performance. Pipelines are expensive to build and maintain, part of the reason why Enbridge has such a strong moat. In order to do that, they need to borrow heavily and thus pay a lot of interest. But there's another reason why net income is not the best metric to look at. Their infrastructure, and so their assets, are massive. Meaning they have large depreciation deductions, bringing the net income down substantially. A better way to look at the bottom line performance or profits of Enbridge is to look at the earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation and amortization or EBITDA. This is a mouthful, I know, and if you're not that deep into financial mumbo jumbo, I might as well have set a random string of numbers and it would have made more sense. Anyway, EBITDA. This basically means how much cash is left over after paying the operating costs of running its business and excluding one-time charges. Unfortunately, I only have EBITDA figures going five years back, but you can see a clear uptrend here, with exception of 2020. This already gives a little hint as to why you should not blindly look at the payout ratios on websites like Seeking Alpha without digging further. More on that in a bit. In their latest presentation, Ambridge expects to grow their EBITDA profit from 13.3 per share to a range of 13.9 to 14.3 per share. This is of course assuming that the economy will further open up again. Another financial metric that is a bit different for pipelines is the free cash flow. Again, if I look at the free cash flow per share graph like this, I would usually run away fast. Free cash flow is often used to determine how much of the cash flow is paid out in dividends to see if the dividends are sustainable. But for Enbridge, this metric again is not very meaningful because of the capital intensity of the pipeline industry. Instead, it is better to look at the distributable cash flow or DCF payout ratio. This is also what Enbridge uses in their financial presentations. Distributable cash flow is calculated by taking the adjusted EBITDA profit and deducting the maintenance that is needed to upkeep their infrastructure and some other costs. For Enbridge, this has been in a steady uptrend like you can see on this image from one of the recent investor presentations. Then the dividends. As a dividend investor, I take a close look at the dividend profile of current dividend income and expected dividend growth. For Enbridge, the sustainability at first glance looks alarming. So why did I still invest in Enbridge? At the time of recording, the dividend return or dividend yield is a bit under 7%, so that looks very enticing, doesn't it? Another thing I want to know is how long a company has raised their dividends, and I want to have at least 5 years of dividend increases. This is no problem for Enbridge, because they have been raising their dividends for 26 years in a row now, making them part of the dividend aristocrats list. I also prefer dividend growth of at least 5%. Again. Enbridge does not disappoint with a 5 year average growth rate of 10%. The last dividend increase was lower at 3 ish percent due to the current environment but I will gladly take it. But then the earnings payout ratio, 125%. Oof. That means they are paying out 125% of their profits. But do you remember that a few minutes ago I explained that the net income or profits is not a meaningful metric to look at for Enbridge? Since the earnings payout ratio is determined by dividing the dividend payout by the profits or earnings per share, this paints a false picture. Instead, we look at the DCF payout ratio, so dividing the dividend by the distributable cash flow. And this is actually around 66%, which is fine for a pipeline with utility like cash flow. If line 5 would be shut down on May 12th though, this ratio will likely shoot up. More on that in a bit. This risk and that of their line 3 project, which still has some execution risk, is reflected in their dividend safety score of 57, which is borderline safe. At the end of the video I will let you know what my thoughts are on this, but in the meantime I'm also curious to know what you think about the dividend safety of Enbridge. Let me know in the comments below. Just as important for the safety of the dividend is the management of debt for Enbridge.
A good way to look at the leverage or debt levels of Enbridge is to look at the debt to EBITDA. This tells you how many years it would take Enbridge to pay off its debt with its EBITDA profits. Management states in their 2020 end of year presentation that they want to keep the debt to EBITDA ratio between 4.5 to 5 times. So it would take them 4.5 to 5 years to fully pay off their debts. But this doesn't really tell us much yet. Because this industry is quite capital intensive, so we can't really compare it to a general benchmark. Instead, let's take a look at some of their peers again, like MPLX, TC Energy and Pembima Pipeline Corporation. Of their peers, they are right in the middle with a net debt to EBITDA of 4.54 over the next 12 months, which is right on target. The current and quick ratio measure how well the current assets, liquid and less liquid, cover the current liabilities. Normally, I would prefer this to be at least at 1 for both. Shockingly, Ambridge only has a current ratio of just about 0.5 and a quick ratio of just under 0.4. But if again, I take a look at their closest peers, it seems that these numbers seem to be the norm for the pipeline industry because they are all more or less around this range. What I also want to figure out as an investor is how well Ambridge is with managing its money. In other words, their capital allocation skills. To do that for Ambridge, I will take a look at the return on invested capital and to understand the ability of Ambridge to borrow money with good rates, I like to look at the S&P credit rating. I would like a percentage above 10% in general. Ambridge is again way lower than that, around 4-6%. to Am I sure this is a good investment? We just do another simple comparison test and find out that most of their peers are even lower than that. So I suspect this has to do with the capital intensity and the utility like regulated returns Ambridge and others get. The S&P credit rating is triple B+, which is among the best in the peer group. Before I will discuss whether I think the Line 5 shutdown is likely to happen and if this is a threat to the dividend safety of Ambridge, first let's take a look at the valuation. I bought Ambridge a bit above 7% yield and right now it is a bit under a 7% yield. But is it still on sale? Due to the recent uptick in price, it is not as undervalued as when I bought it. According to the different yield theory, it is undervalued around $34 but fair value lies around $49 based on a 5 year average yield of 5.22. Double checking this with the fair value estimate on another website, they have a fair value around $44. With a price around $40 now, it seems there is still some value left. But the big question looming over Ambridge is, will they be forced to shut down their Line 5 pipeline on May 12th, one day after this episode airs? Ambridge itself doesn't seem to think so at least and they have already stated that they will not comply unless they get a court order to do so. The executive president of the liquid pipelines, Mr. Yu, has already declared this in an interview with CBC News. In that interview, Mr. Yu also explains that the shutdown would have far-reaching consequences for other US states like Ohio and Pennsylvania as well, since they also depend on the energy sources transported through these pipelines. Other than that, it is not only crude that is running through this pipeline, but also propane. According to Derek Dalling, executive director of the Michigan Propane Gas Association, Michigan is a small part of all propane that runs through Line 5, but this small piece accounts for 55% of all propane demand in Michigan. The alternative is to transport propane and other energy sources by train or boat, and the small piece that Michigan needs already means that 10,000 train cars of propane have to be transported each year by rail. With all the environmental and safety risk of transporting over land as a consequence. On top of that, on the Canadian side, the city of Sarnia, Ontario, is very reliant on the throughput and output of this pipeline, which could cause a job loss of nearly 5,000 people. So from that perspective, it seems very unlikely that Line 5 will actually be shut down. But on the opposite side, the streets have been described by environmentalists as one of the worst places on earth to have built a pipeline that carries toxic material. The Straits of Mackinac is one of the world's busiest freshwater shipping lanes. That makes navigation unusually difficult, even before accounting for the treacherous wind patterns at the convergence of the two giant lakes. A sunken ship could open a gash in the pipelines. And Governor Whitmer does not seem to budge, even when Ambridge is already working on a replacement tunnel for Line 5, which would be completed in three years. Whitmer is also close to President Biden, so she definitely has connections to make this a big problem for Ambridge. Despite that, I think it is very unlikely that Ambridge will be forced to shut down the Line 5. The Financial Post contacted legal experts on the matter, which stated that the best scenario for Canada and all parties involved 
is to reach a diplomatic resolution. If that fails, the Canadian government also has additional legal options available. With the stakes being this high and a lot of higher governmental forces involved, again I think it is very unlikely that Enbridge will be forced to shut down their Line 5 by May 12. Since I think it is very unlikely, I also think it is very unlikely that the dividend of Enbridge is in any danger. It is well covered now and I think will be in the future. Another in-depth analysis on the dividend stock which also pays higher than average dividends and has decent dividend growth is Store Capital. So if you are interested in that, I strongly suggest you to watch the video on the right. I'm off, until next week.